there has been some progress, but frankly, it's not fast enough. And it would be great to be coming here, not talking about the problems, but talking about the rebuild and moving forward uh, with this great region, rather than talking about the challenges that we still have uh, further you know, months down the road. So I know that things are tough all over New Zealand at the moment, but I know they are even tougher here in Hawke's Bay. And unfortunately, you know, what happens after a crisis uh, or the event that we saw is there's lots of immediate attention from the media and from the country and from others. And then time moves on and actually you're left here trying to pick up the pieces and work out how you go forward from here. And so I just want to say um, it can feel pretty lonely. And I acknowledge that in the conversations that I've had with some of you already, just how difficult and how tough it has been. And the longer it goes on, the more expensive it gets to fix, but more importantly, the mental health toll is immense as well. And I think you're not asking for much. You're not asking for what does the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years look like. You're actually just wanting a much clearer set of decisions to be made around giving you certainty and clarity to remove that anxiety and that stress uh, that you are dealing with uh, on a daily basis. So I want to say to you... Um, you know, you need decisions around schools, you need decisions around livelihoods, you need decisions around homes and local and regional infrastructure. That's what's going to enable you to move forward in the way that we want you to. Uh, I can tell you there's an election coming up in 40 days, uh, and it's not really about the electioneering or the politicking this issue. This is a New Zealand issue, and I've tried really hard from day one to be really part, you know, to be bipartisan with the government, supporting them with the budget, supporting them with the processes, the regulations that they need to get emergency powers and to get things happening. But I know how harrowing this event has been, and I just know for some of you, and from what you're hearing in the community also, I just want to reassure you on two things. And the first is that I hear from in the community that, you know, you better hurry up and make some decisions because a national government could come to power and everything could change. And I want to tell you two commitments. The first is that um, we know that the last thing you need is, is more change from a go an incoming national government. What you need to know is that we are going to back up the commitments and the undertakings that have been made by the current Labor government. Uh, we're going to make sure we're not going back to ground zero and reinventing everything and turning everything upside down again. Uh, we are going to make sure that we actually meet those commitments, meet those obligations uh, and actually uh, fully honour them as, as a result. But the second thing that we need to do is we need to get this region growing again. We need to power up this region big time. This is a country in an economic recession, and this is a really important part of our economic engine, this region. And so we want to see it recover, and we want to see it recover quickly and well and to move ahead. And so we're wanting to know, we, we want to see what we can do to speed up the recovery effort. So take for granted that we will, we will honour the obligations, the money, the processes, the, we're not blowing everything up from, the pre, from what the Labour government's been doing. We will honour all those undertakings and fully back that up but we're actually also wanting to power up the region and get through this recovery quicker because this limbo space, uh, place is not a good place for us all to be. So I'm pleased today to announce a few things. The first is that um, Chris and I and, and, and Catherine and Katie have thought quite deeply about what we can do to speed up uh, elements of the recovery. And um, it's really important, um, the four things that I think that we can do. And the first thing I want to say is that we're going to establish a cyclone and a flood recovery ombudsman. And what that means is that the purpose of that is to get people that have been affected by Cyclone Gabriel and other recent major flooding events across the country to have an impartial and an independent voice to protect their interests. Because part of what I've heard from you is that you, have, you, you want consultation. And the best way to set that up is like we have a banking ombudsman, we want to have a cyclone and a flood recovery ombudsman. And that means that if you've got displaced households and businesses and you believe that your property has been wrongly categorised or that fair value is not being offered for a buyout of that property, they will give a clear, be given a clear right of appeal to the new Cyclone and Flood Recovery Ombudsman. And that means that's an independent office that will actually be charged with ensuring that government decisions are fair, transparent and just. And they can review the situation and make recommendations about how, how things should be handled on a case-by-case -case basis. Because that's part of, the, part of the challenge, is that everyone's got a unique set of circumstances uh, around value, around categorisation, uh, and it's different within the community uh, as across whole communities. The second thing is that we are really going to prioritise um, infrastructure projects that connect this region to other communities. And so you've heard us make under our Transport for the Future our big priorities, three of our big four resilience priorities are in this region. And that is actually building that Hawke's Bay Expressway. It's making sure we upgrade State Highway 2, State Highway 5, and those are the three big roading projects that we think are really critical to establish connectivity uh, from this community to other communities. 
The third thing is that we have to therefore then expedite the consenting and the removal of red tape because that is slowing things down. And we supported the government with what are called orders in council. These are basically emergency powers that the government has available to them today. Uh, and we want those applied really quickly to crunching through resource consent. So that doesn't slow us up. It doesn't, get us, does, it doesn't put the red tape into the system. And the last bit is that we need to unblock uh, the EQC property assessment uh, piece as well, because that's way too slow. And so we want to set some target timeframes around how quickly we get them to respond to assessing the values of properties, but also that includes for them to bring in overseas assessors uh, into New Zealand, which we can expedite through immigration settings, uh, in order to actually move through that process in a much quicker way. And so for us, we think that there is um, those four things can make a difference. If we genuinely have a flood and cyclone recovery ombudsman that individuals can go to, where it's got independence, it's got some teeth to hold the government to account and to, ch to, to push back on decisions that people think are unjust, that's exactly what we need to have. We need to get cracking with these infrastructure projects and linked to that is actually fast tracking consenting so we're not caught up in red tape and having the same conversation as another year goes by and another year goes by and nothing's changed. And then we need to unblock the EQC assessment pipeline so we actually get property values assessed quicker uh, so that people can move forward uh, and, and get, through the, get through what they need to get through. So, you know, I want you to be reassured. We're going to back up and hold you know, to all the undertakings, all the commitments that the, that the current government's made. Uh, you do not need us turning everything upside down and starting from ground zero again, but you need to know that we are rock solid and we will meet every obligation, every commitment made. We also think we can speed it up, though, and that's what we now have to focus on because we desperately want this region powered back up and making a big contribution to the New Zealand economy. And with that, I'm just going to pass off to Chris Pink, who will give a bit more detail around some of those four components as well. So thank you, Chris. Uh, thank you very much, Christopher, um, to Casey and Catherine, um, and to all those who are gathered here today and who have very generously shared their stories and, and the visits that Christopher and I have been making, and of course Casey and Catherine on the ground are uh, such great advocates for their community. Uh, it's been clear in those stories that you've been telling us uh, that uh, you're in an interesting space, you've got that tension of wanting to have that certainty of being able to move forward, including that continuity with the general election coming up. Uh, as Christopher's mentioned, but uh, I'm also acutely aware that for a large number of people they've got particular circumstances that they mean that they don't uh, fit exactly into those uh, broad brush categories, categories three, two and one. Uh, that are not livable for, in a safe basis. Uh, category 2, where mitigating measures uh, might make it so, or Category 1, where they can uh, go ahead and, and remain in place. Uh, so for those who are uh, perhaps a line ball between the different categories, uh, whether it's that they've got a mixed residential or commercial use, uh, it might be uh, that they've got uh, uh, something that, uh, you know, basically the, the question is whether, you know, how, how far... Uh, around a property, you actually uh, draw those lines. What's the basis of the buyout? What's the market value? All these really specific, difficult questions uh, are going to need to be nutted out. And the government set in place um, some frameworks that are pretty broad uh, and understandably so, but the reality is for those who are uh, at danger of slipping between those cracks, we need uh, a mechanism uh, to have uh, independent from council uh, to provide a, a second opinion uh, another source of advice to government to see these people, uh, you know, done, done the right thing by them. So that's why Christopher has today announced the Ombudsman uh, role that will set up for a couple of years. Uh, we hope that we'll be able to quickly expedite uh, outstanding claims uh, and situations uh, of a lack of certainty. Uh, and we'll task that person in that office uh, with looking really closely at how uh, we can ensure people um, have their expectations met if we can do that safely. So an example would be for people who uh, were in, in an unsafe situation in mid-February of this year uh, because they didn't receive warnings that should have been given or they received them too late, we'll say to that ombudsman, well look, if, if it's possible to mitigate the danger such that they can safely live there and they don't need to be a Category 3, uh, then they'll be able to uh, stay in that place after all, maybe be a Category 2 with some extra mitigating measures or perhaps a Category 1. But again, just to emphasise, no one will be worse off by the uh, mechanism of having this additional safety net because for people who are offered, for example, a Category 3 buyout at a compensation level that is fair and reasonable for them and they want to go, uh, we will honour that. We will allow them to move on quickly because uh, that uncertainty, that feeling of being left in limbo uh, is the key theme that permeates all the discussions that, that, that all of us have had in this place these past six or so months. 
So that's the first point. Uh, the second point was uh, those um, big infrastructure projects um, that the leaders mentioned, uh, focusing on those transport links, but also recognising the importance of communications infrastructure. And uh, as he said, it's about connecting those communities and those regions. Uh, it's understanding that when you talk to people here, uh, they have uh, work and family life that goes across the different regions. Mm -hmm. uh, and if this area and other cyclone hit communities in New Zealand are uh, to grow back uh, to their former glory uh, and even better, uh, then of course we need to connect them with other parts of New Zealand uh, for those people-to-people -people links and that commerce uh, and for the export potential in an area like Hawke's Bay uh, with horticulture and other industries uh, that provide such great export revenue for us. We need to get those goods from here uh, to other ports overseas and so forth. So those links are crucially important uh, not only for the uh, uh, emotional uh, and uh, and uh, financial health of individual households and businesses, but also for the economic recovery of the region as a whole, and of course from the New Zealand Inc. That third point um, that Christopher's mentioned uh, is in relation to um, using uh, orders in council, so that's the regulations that can be made. It's a stroke of the pen uh, that if you're sitting in the beehive currently, the, the government can say, well, we're going to uh, find a way to really quickly circumvent existing legislation. We're going to make it possible for you to do those things on your property uh, that the business as usual rules say that you can't do. But actually, we're not in business as usual. That needs to be recognised. Mm. The government has given itself that power. It was legislation that was supported by National. Uh, as the bosses mentioned, because we said in an emergency, uh, it's important to allow the government of the day to act quickly. So we will use every power available to us uh, in response to the needs that you are telling us you have in order to grow back better, again, at a household, a business, a community level, and for the benefit of New Zealand Inc. And then finally, that piece around EQC. So the land damage assessments are a major blockage in the pipeline. Uh, and at the current rate of progress with those being resolved, uh, we've looked ahead to three years worth of uncertainty uh, that some landowners will have. Uh, clearly that's not good enough uh, from a mental health perspective uh, in terms of recovering financially, again, emotionally uh, and for the region. So we've said we'll uh, bring that up uh, much more quickly, we'll set those targets. Uh, we need to scale up following an emergency and that's what's not happened so far. Uh, EQC has uh, limited standing resources but to be able to get um, additional uh, capacity from Australia with the uh, qualified technical experts that we need uh, or else we're across the world. Um, let's get them here, let's help, uh, let's get them to help us get the job done. Uh, from there we'll be able to get back to not life as normal as best as possible uh, in this wonderful place. So um, those are our key points, obviously happy to speak more to those uh, along with the leader and our wonderful candidates here. Uh, but just to acknowledge again all those conversations that have led us to understand uh, that you want us to move quickly, you want the government of the day uh, to provide you that certainty uh, that you've got locked in, the things that are important to you, but also we can go further and faster. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so um, hopefully you get a good sense of our commitments, which is one, uh, do not uh, let anyone scare you into anything that we're not going to honour the commitments that have already been made to you and to the communities. And importantly, we need to fast track and we need to speed up the recovery so we can get the region pumping and back on track again. Uh, it's very much where we're at. With that, happy to take any questions from the media, maybe. Yeah, sorry, yeah, sorry, yeah, sorry. How are you? Just a question about the actual night that it happened. Yes. So obviously civil defence didn't evacuate any of the people in Hooks Bay. Yeah. So the only risk to life was what they did to us. Mm. Now we're all being punished for it. Will you order a commission of inquiry into that? We definitely want an inquiry. I know there's been an inquiry, I think, that's been talked about. I'm not sure, Chris, whether it's actually kicked off yet. Yeah, but not enough public inputs. Yeah. Yes, that's the point. That's the point I was just... Coming up. Yeah. We do not trust... Yeah. Thoughts. Yeah. So that's why we just said is what... Yeah, so what we said is not enough community involvement, and so we need to make sure that we get an inquiry in place that gets that in place. Uh, I, I met with many of you, if you remember, in those first few weeks, and I remember meeting with you in a hall not very far from here, and I heard those stories of just how uh, a number of you burst into action, and actually that was a difference between um, people getting rescued and not getting rescued. It was some incredible stories. You saved yourselves. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, and so I know how you feel about that. So, yes, um, we'll make sure we've... died, and, you know, the fact of the matter is if it was on your property and they died and you were the boss, you'd be prosecuted. Mm. And yet the council seems to be... The regional council seems to be getting off scot-free. Yeah, so we'll make sure there's a good inquiry with good, good, good consultation so that we actually get those views uh, captured. Hastings yes, District ma Council had viable CDM in this valley until 2015. 
They centralised back to Hastings. The whole thing fell over. We had 150 plus yes. NZQA qualified yeah. emergency people. Yes. We were ignored. Yeah. No, I know how you feel. I, rem I remember the conversations well. Yep. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yes, you are. Category two to category three. Yep. Yep. And they keep voting a risk to life, but actually nobody died in Park Fire except on the part that they have reinstated to one. Um, and they're saying we can't get out. Mm -hmm. We live right by that roundabout on Park Fire Road. Yes. And they're saying it's because of the way. The riverbank, um, the, the, the two rivers were merged yes. back in the 60s. Yes. Now, you talk about your different roads. Waka Kotahi at the moment are praising themselves on the millions they've spent for cycle tracks yeah. by <laughs> removing um, rails and removing roads, yes. reclaiming land. And yet they say, no, the park of five, we can't do that. Yeah. And, um, no, we know on Parker Fire there's a, there's a particular set of challenges as you've been reclassified from two to three, uh, and a lot about what's the mitigating infrastructure that could support uh, Parker Fire, and also that's why the Ombudsman is a really good starting point for us, because it means you're going to have a, a proper, independent, powered up, funded, it'll cost us $7 million to fund that office to make sure that we actually are properly holding the government to account, and where you have real genuine grievances like that, and there's a number of other issues that will capture that, um, that's the chance to then come back and push back uh, very strongly. Yep. Just, you want everything to move fast. I know. Some things are moving too fast. You know, you have to have the submission in by this date and that date. Yes. And, you know, that this one on Category 3 buyout is, has to be in tomorrow. Yes. You know that? And that's why I was a little bit alluding to that earlier, because sometimes people are using the election as a reason for why you need to do things quickly, because everything's apparently going to change on the other side. And that's why I wanted to reassure you that actually the commitments that have been made, the money that's going to be spent, um, the process that we've got up and running, we're not going back to turn this whole thing upside down and starting from scratch again. We'll, we'll look to work on what we've got to improve it and to speed it up uh, where it makes sense. So, yep. Great. All right, well, um, I'll, I'll come and catch up with um, more locals and hear some of the individual reactions and stories would be good. Um, with that, why don't we go to the media um, and any questions that you may have. In terms of the ombudsman and the power that they will have, yeah. I suppose if you're in Category 3, you want to go down to Category 2, or you get a bad valuation and you want an extra $200,000 for example, yes. how much power will they have in terms of making final decisions? Will it be a recommendation that they make to go to the capital wall? They'd be able to make a call and say, right, this is how it's going to yeah. it, it'll be um, It'll be recommendations that they can make as well, but they'll be an independent ombudsman, exactly like we have with the banking ombudsman, for example, uh, where they have some real teeth and real independence to hold the government to account, and where they think there's some decision that hasn't been uh, justly made, uh, they can make an intervention there. What? Chris, did you want to talk about that a bit more? Yeah, yeah thanks, boss. So... Um, as you've said, it's a power to examine decisions and, and a power of recommendation, um, and that's traditional for an ombudsman setup, and that's why we've gone with that that wording in that role specifically. Um, you know, in terms of local government um, being a decision maker, not only in terms of uh, infrastructure that's needed, but also uh, zoning and, and the categorisation decisions, um, they've got some skin in the game in terms yeah. of the financial side, but so too the central government, which is why when Christopher says holding the government to account, that that includes us. So, um, you know, we would take very seriously any recommendations made by the ombudsman specifically because they're coming in without a vested interest uh, in that sense. So, so to represent the people who go to them and say, look, you need to have another look because I'm these particular set of circumstances. And it might be something as straightforward as the valuation not having captured the fact that there'd been additional work done on the property prior to uh, the cyclone going through that wasn't obvious. So, again, just that second opportunity to have a look. Why, why spend $7 million to set up a new office and not fold the powers and responsibilities into... 
Yeah, well, look, that's a good question because there are a number of different um, ombudsmen or similar type roles that, that have elements of that. But it's the fact that it goes across a quite a few different um, areas. So there's a banking ombudsman, there's an insurance ombudsman, and obviously private insurance is a major aspect of the rebuild. And part of the difficulty that the good people of this area and other cyclone-affected areas of the country have is that their private insurer either isn't coming to the party or is unable to move forward in terms of a buyout or a rebuild because they don't have that certainty of knowing if they're going to be able to. So in terms of having an ombudsman who's uh, dedicated for cyclone and flood recovery, it captures all those different issues and reflects the breadth of different uh, ways that people's lives and businesses are affected by this. And, and while it will be a, a two-year duration, because that's what I think we owe the people, is to work through these issues really quickly, um, but what it also says is that there is some proto-thinking there, that inevitably when there are other similar-like events in, in New Zealand, we've got some of the, the structure and the framing in place to be able to deal with those in the future as well. So, so sort of rev it up every time they need it. Well, potentially, and I think you know, that's what we're trying to get is the scaffolding in place and the processes in place so that actually... Um, um, when we see these issues, we can work through them in a much quicker way going forward as well. And so uh, that's why I think the ombudsman role has teeth, it has genuine inde independence, and it can hold the government to account. And it can, most importantly is there to represent the interests of the people, uh, not the government. Uh, and that's important. How quickly will you be able to establish them? Um, we want to move very, very immediately, you know, so as fast as we possibly can. And so that'll be, we, let's be clear, when we take over on October the 15th, if we're lucky to do so, um, we have an awful lot of work to do to turn this country around, but this will be featuring very strongly in our 100-day plan. Yep. Right, but it takes a long time to set these things up. And, you know, so how long will it take to build this? And then how quickly are you expecting decisions to be made? Because there's clearly a lot of palpable frustration there right is. now. And so I'm sure, you know, people don't want to be waiting for you to set up another agency, yep. and that agency then has to go into and look at all of the evidence before they make a decision. So how long before this ombudsman makes its first decision? Well, we're going to be setting this thing up as fast as we can. As I said, it will feature very strongly in our 100-day plan because it has to. And I, I appreciate the first thing is we have to get elected on October the 14th, uh, but then after that we actually have to get this country unblocked and we have to get uh, moving from a country of bureaucrats into a, company, a country of can-do and getting things done, and that's what we're going to do. So um, we, we will be crashing through processes to get things done incredibly quickly, and we are going to do things differently from how things have been done. We already have orders in council that give the government emergency powers to bypass any of our existing REMA, any of our other existing processes, and we'll use every tool available to us to actually get uh, this thing set up. But more importantly, to get action here, because, you know, as I keep saying to you, we are in a recession. We are the only country in the whole of the Asia-Pacific region in an economic recession. We need this region powering up horticulture in a big way. And I just say on horticulture, um, you, know, the good, you know, the good news is after three goes and coming very late to the party, uh, the horticulture sector is comfortable with the process that it's got with the government. We will keep that in place, make sure that money flows in that way. But we need to power up horticulture, we need to power up the region fast. Okay. I've got, just got some other questions on the scattergun of other areas. Yep. New Zealand Dental Association says that it's undercosted its free dental policy by 50%. What do you make of that? Um, look, I, I'm very sceptical of this government's ability to get anything done, if I'm honest with you. I mean, we had a pol they had a policy in 2020 to put 20 mobile dental clinics across New Zealand, and that hasn't been able to be achieved. You've seen dentists go on strike with respect to pay, uh, and you've heard that announcement from the Dental Association saying, look, even if we provide free dental care for under-18s, many dentists don't do it because the government doesn't pay them the going market rate. And that is why it is, a, it's a, it's, everyone wants to expand dental care to New Zealanders. That's what we would all love to do. But the reality is when you weigh up the health care budget with limited resources and with lots of unmet need, you know, we have to focus on the must-do stuff. And the must-do stuff is why are we 4,500 nurses short? Why are we 1,700 doctors short? That's what we've got to fix first and foremost. And on the attack ads today, um, first of all, do you even own the pinstripe suit? Or has that been photoshopped? And secondly, do you personally feel under attack? Um, look, I mean, I just think it's incredibly sad uh, to, and, and pathetic, to be, on, to be honest, that um, Chris Hipkins, the Labour Party and the CTU have decided that they want to go personal and negative attacking me. Um, I, I'm, you know, I can take attacks for 41 days until the election result. Um, what I'm worried about is Kiwis losing their homes. What I'm worried about is Kiwis not feeling safe in their businesses or their communities. What I'm worried about is not being able to access health care or be able to get their kids educated. So, you know, I think it's incredibly sad. I think from a CTU point of view, you know, they purport to, rec rec you know, to, to you know, support working people. 
I would have thought they would have wanted to come out in support of our tax plan last week, which actually says to the squeeze middle and to working and low and middle income New Zealanders, here's some tax relief so that you keep more of your own money in your own pocket. Speaking of your tax plan, will your tax on foreign buyers apply to foreigners? Only apply to foreigners, sorry. Correct. So yes, that's why it's called foreign a foreign buyer <laughs> tax ban. Yep. Um, and You're certain about that? Yes. Is that how you structure yes, it? Yes, 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 absolutely. Okay. And why did you only get advice on tax treaties after you had released your tax plan? No, we had advice from experts and lawyers before, and we've continued to talk to experts afterwards as well. That's what we do. And we are very confident and absolutely confident in our numbers and also in our proposal. So I am incredibly confident about that. But there's a lot of experts coming saying that the numbers just don't stack up. So, if the numbers don't stack up, what is your backstop? Is it cuts or borrowing? I and can what tell has that got to do with us uh, and the value? I, I can tell you, you really... We'll, we'll, we'll come back. Now. Yeah, we'll come back to that. I promise you I'll come and spend some time and we'll follow that up. Um, what, what I'd say to you is that um, I am incredibly confident about our numbers and I appreciate that the Labor Party want to stir on that, but I don't trust them. They have run this economy into the ground. Uh, we know numbers. We've got our plans validated. We've spoken to experts and lawyers before. We've spoken to experts afterwards and we are very confident with respect to tax treaties and with the FTAs that we can actually get our tax, uh, our foreign buyer ban in place. Are you worried about how China might react? No, I'm not. Why not? Uh, I'm not, because we, we, we are very confident that actually we have done the work with experts and lawyers around both aspects, FTAs and tax treaties, and actually uh, this is a good proposal and a good plan. You, just, you, just, I just want to remind you, why are we doing this? New Zealand is the most restrictive country in the OECD, the developed world, around foreign direct investment. Many businesses in this region would actually like to have a partner or some talent, you know, whether it's in technology or whether it's in a business that actually comes in from overseas bringing talent and bringing capital. And one of the things that those owners can't do is actually buy property in New Zealand. So we're saying you've got to buy a property above $2 million. Remember, the average house price in New Zealand now is below $900,000. And for the privilege of that, we are going to tax you 15%, and we're going to take that money, and we're going to give it to low- and middle-income workers through our tax plan. On I think that's element, common sense, and I think it's smart. On another element of your tax plan, the online, taxing the online gambling corporations, have you looked into how you can tax corporations which aren't based in New Zealand that we had uh, double tax agreements with? What we've talked about is the online uh, international gambling platforms that many other countries have found ways to raise revenue and to tax from. We want to raise revenue from that and make sure again that we can direct those monies into low and middle income New Zealanders so they keep more of their own money in their own pocket. And, and just on, just sorry, just sorry, last one. Do you, believe, do you believe in equity of outcome? Uh, I believe in an equality of opportunity that actually kids in New Zealand, irrespective of their families or their, or their communities or their neighbourhoods, should through things like education be able to get from a set of circumstances to a better set of circumstances. And that's what our party will continue to work incredibly hard at in government as well. I am a recipient of that. I am a kid whose parents left school at 15, 16. I'm the first to go to university in my family. Education got me from a set of circumstances to a better set of circumstances. And I want that for every Kiwi kid because that's how they flourish and that's how they realise their version of the Kiwi dream. OK. Do you, do you feel Sorry. under pressure over this, over this tax... The foreign buyers tax? Absolutely not. Uh, I think we, we delivered an outstanding tax plan that said to low and middle income New Zealanders, the squeeze middle, who are waking up each morning, going to work, paying their taxes, doing everything right and still can't get ahead, that actually we owe it to them to be able to get ahead for themselves. And that's what that plan's all about. It was well thought through. It's been well costed. We've worked on it for months. We've engaged experts where we needed to. And actually, it's going to deliver for New Zealanders. And it's going to make sure that they can get ahead. And that's what this country is all about. If you work hard in the best country on earth, you should be able to get ahead. And that's what we're doing. Can I just check? Do you, do you want to strike so? Uh, I, I do, yes. Uh, but that, that photo was taken from when I was CEO of Air New Zealand. Yep, as I understand it. Sat oh eight to Sat and the expressway. There's a lot of roads. Um, yes. How much money will go to that? Any more details? We can sort of flesh well, as we said in our Transport for the Future plan, uh, there's obviously the Resilience uh, Fund. There's $6 billion sitting in that. And this is a major priority for us. We, we know those three projects are incredibly important 
to rebuild the road, uh, to rebuild the region. And so uh, once we're in government, we're moving with that with great speed. Again, what I want is consultation with the community, not NZTA independently deciding what it, what it thinks should happen. It has to work in consultation to make sure we get it done properly. You just mentioned rebuild. Rebuild before you do upgrade, is it? Complete upgrade or is it just rebuild what we basically We're going to make sure we've got a world class set of roads on State Highway 2, 5 and the, and the Hawke's Bay Expressway. It's that simple. We want modern, reliable infrastructure. If we want to build an advanced, small country, one of the best in the world, and for that to happen, we have to have modern, reliable infrastructure and a fantastic roading and transport network. OK, can I say thank you so much to the media for coming out? I'm going to spend a bit more time with the folks and uh, go through some of their issues and concerns.